And our final lecture on Afghanistan, A Country in Turmoil, Part 3, is 1992 to the present. So this is going to take us up clear into the war on terror and the United States invasion of Afghanistan. Now, of course, those events are still going on, so I can't really comment historically on what is going on in the present day of Afghanistan. And to be fair, even the last 10 years are a little bit murky because so much of it is unfolding and most of our information is coming from uh, journalists and journalism and it's still being hotly debated in the political world today. So everyone has something to say about Afghanistan and it might not always be as, as true or as accurate or it's being used for a political purpose. So understanding Afghanistan by that point, the closer we get to the present, the more difficult it becomes. So mainly we're going to focus on the 1990s and how Afghanistan evolves into the present day state that it is. So to recap one last time, Afghanistan in the modern context had been a modern kingdom from the 1930s into the mid, -19, mid to late 1970s, uh, famous for its uh, uh, constitutional monarchy and uh, progressive reforms. It then became a much more liberal left-leaning social, uh, uh, socialist, uh, at least socialist light republic, but not a socialist state or a communist state. And then eventually it became the, the People's Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, which was a communist state in the style of the Soviet Union, uh, which eventually caused the Soviet Union to invade, to defend that government against uh, Islamic rebels in the countryside. Our last lecture saw the, the um, uh, withdrawal of the Soviet Union under Gorbachev in 1988, and eventually the fall and collapse of the PDPA in 1992. And that would have been what was called the first Afghan civil war. So the, the, the Soviet Afghan war officially is 1979 to 1989. But that war itself really continues until 1992. Uh, because the the uh, purpose of the war from be, for being fought in the first place uh, the, was to prop up and defend the communist party uh, of Afghanistan. And that party would not collapse until 1992. So our longer Soviet war involves and also includes the first Afghan civil war. And there are two key Afghan civil wars, the first and the second. We'll talk about the second the, during this slideshow. So by 1989, the Soviet Union withdraws completely out of Afghanistan. The picture on the right is a picture of the Soviet forces leaving Afghanistan uh, and going back across the river into Uzbekistan. The U.S. ends Operation Cyclone in 1989, and they stop giving military and economic aid to, uh, the, the, to Afghanistan by 1992. The United States is able to still give them some aid, but really by 1999, uh, 1992, the Mahuja Adin uh, received very little of it from the United States, and there is very little money that goes into the construction and reconstruction of Afghanistan. And there's various reasons for this. On one hand, there are some that feel that uh, the Afghanis don't really uh, need our help anymore. And so there's really no reason to stick around. This would be kind of the idea that our whole purpose being there was to get rid of the Soviet Union. But to be fair, this is not entirely the case. Uh, it wasn't as cold-hearted as that. There are also those that believe that trying to reconstruct Afghanistan would be a form of imperialism. And so are, uh, specifically a, a form of imperialism, imperialism called nation building. Doing in Afghanistan what the Soviet Union was trying to do build or rebuild this nation into a nation that would align with our interests. So more or less after 1992, the United States becomes uh, hands off. And the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan collapses at the end of 1992 uh, with the first Afghan civil war, or in what is known as the first Afghan civil war. That would be between the remnants of the Mujahideen and the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. Here's another picture of, uh, well, this, this is actually not the Mujahideen. This is a group called the Taliban. And we're going to be introduced to the Taliban today. You might not know who the Taliban are. Some of you probably have heard the term before. 
The Taliban are considered kind of a terrorist group, but they are in charge of Afghanistan throughout the majority of the 1990s. And the Taliban, although are do use acts of terror, they are the quote unquote legitimate legitimate government of Afghanistan even to this day. Well, I take that back. Again, I don't want to get too much into modern Afghanistan because it's very messy. There is a there is a, a liberal democracy in Afghanistan, but the Taliban are still there fighting it. It's it's a mess. But throughout the 1990s, the Taliban are in charge. Though they look like terrorists, and they are terrorists. They look like kind of uh, ruffians that run around the hillside. This group of men make up the legitimate government of Afghanistan throughout the 90s. So much of what what makes Afghanistan what we think of it today is is sort of uh, drawn out during the the vestiges of the second Afghan civil war between 1992 and 1996. Just to reiterate, Afghanistan had been in war from 1978 until 1996, with only a very brief period of of break before the 2001 American invasion. So this is a country. Uh, one must have some sympathy for. They've been under complete warfare for the, for several generations. There are generations that live in Afghanistan that know nothing but war. And this is an unfortunate side effect of just some of the evils that this world has to offer. But there's still very much people involved in Afghanistan that bring war in for themselves. So they're not always innocent, but I'm just speaking more broadly about the situation. Now, during the second Afghan civil war, the Mujahideen begins to fracture and separate. The Mujahideen is no longer the force that it used to be. That unified force of tribesmen who all practice Islam, but practice Islam very differently and had different views of government, and had different educational backgrounds, fracture uh, into separate groups and organizations. And there's mainly, well, there's three main sides to this to this puzzle. The second Afghan civil war has sort of a trifecta of sides. It's not north or south or east or west or religious and non-religious. It's, it's different shades of these groups that begin to compete for control of the entire uh, region. So some of these uh, people are going to be secular and they're in support of a secular government. Some of these people are going to be religious fanatics and they're going to be uh, interested in a religious theocratic style government. The population of Afghanistan is predominantly Muslim. I mean, nearly every single person in Afghanistan practices Islam, about 95%. And so all of them want Islam to be involved in some regard, but it's just a question of how much. Even those people who are in, uh, in support of secular government still want Islam to have an important cultural uh, uh, purpose in the government and in Islamic, in, in Afghani society, they want to perhaps, the most secular of these would like to go back to the Republic of Afghanistan. That would be the government under uh, Mohammed Darid Khan, the one that was uh, not communist, but flirted with socialism before the, the communist government of, of, this, of uh, Afghanistan took over. But the most extreme and fundamentalist and tribalistic of all of these sides would like a theocratic Islamic society, one in which a very strict interpretation of the Quran, and specifically a very very tribal, very fanatic, and very fundamentalist interpretation of the Quran is used. And that's what we kind of have over here on the right with this gentleman uh, about to whip or beat uh, somebody who committed some kind of crime or some kind of transgression. Uh, in, in Afghani society. So this person here holding the whip uh, is some sort of guard, some sort of uh, member of the ruling class, and he's about to beat this person for a reason that I, I don't know what it is. But it just shows you that it's a very aggressive, a very disciplinary, and very authoritarian type of government. Islamic militancy, though, continues to grow, continues to radicalize, it continues to get worse, because after the Americans uh, withdraw their aid after the Soviets leave and after the, the communist society falls, all of the schools and the things that the communist government had opened, schools for women, schools for girls, schools for orphans, uh, make no mistake about it, I don't want to sound sympathetic to the communists, but the communists were still in the Western tradition. 
And by Western tradition, I mean schools, education, uh, distribution of wealth to the poor, uh, similar to what you find in Western Europe and to a certain extent in the United States. The United States is not a, not a communist society, but we have those things here too. We have public education. We have things like Medicare and Medicaid. We have VA hospitals. They were starting to construct the same things in the People's Democratic Republic of Afghanistan with the Soviet Union helping. And by the 1990s, most of those were closed, shuttered, and dismantled. This left a lot of poor, displaced people, a lot of angry students, a lot of people who are angry and part of the working class, uh, who are looking for something in their lives to fill the void. And they start to gravitate more and more towards their religion and towards a militaristic interpretation of their religion with these uh, very skillful, very charming, and very charismatic uh, men who are equally radical leading them. And they are inspired by the Iranian revolution, which we'll talk about next week, to create an Islamic state in Afghanistan similar to what is in Iran. The first side of the second Afghan civil war is going to be held, is going to be fought on behalf of people who want to return to the modern secularism. These are going to be people who backed the Republic of Afghanistan and to a certain extent some of the moderates who were who were okay with the idea of communism during the uh, and socialism during the uh, the Democratic uh, Republic, although they would not have been interested in the uh, the heavy handedness of the um, Soviet style tactics of the Democratic Republic. Uh, these people are urban dwellers, they are elites, they are college educated, they're educated in Afghanistan, they're educated around the world. Uh, you can see this picture over here uh, on the right. These are people attending a university in Kabul during the era of the Republic of Afghanistan in the 1970s. Uh, and look, there are men and women sitting together. Uh, the women are not covered, their hair is down, they're dressed all in, in robes and gowns, they are receiving degrees. So this side really wants to see a return to this kind of Western style uh, Republic of Afghanistan with a, um, a much freer democratic Republican style of government uh, with a parliament and a president and with economics that lean more to the left and practice certain degrees of uh, Western European socialism, but not all out hardcore socialist communism. Uh, they want an electoral system, they want unions, they want universities, they want status and rights and protections for women, they want property rights secured. Uh, so they're not going to be communist, nor are they going to be fundamentalists. They are a, to, to, to really draw a parallel, they want to be like the French or the Germans or the Canadians or the British. That's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, government they're looking to mimic and model. So they're going to be one side of the triangle of sides in this war. Unfortunately, because of their location, even though the urban areas are quite large and densely populated, as a whole, they are going to be a minority. And while they do have a significant numerical advantage in some regards, their, their geographical reach will not be as, as far. And because their views are considered quite foreign, they're going to become increasingly a minority as time goes on. The second side is, is helmed by a group called the United Front, or if you're old enough to remember, the Northern Alliance. The Northern Alliance is a coalition of tribal peoples that live in the northern part of Afghanistan, closer to the Soviet border. These are going to be made up ethnically of Uzbeks, Taziks, and Turks. And they were formerly members of the Mujahideen. They are led by the man pictured here, a rather dashing and handsome looking man. It looks like a, 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 a photograph advertising something. This is Ahmad Shah Masood. And he is a, a very charismatic, a very aggressive, very brilliant tactician. He is a Muslim and he is proud to be a Muslim, but he's unique. He's not your typical, what you, he's not a member of the fundamentalist uh, extremist class. He's not a member of this, well, he's a tribal, he's a tribal man, but he is educated in Europe and educated in urban areas. Though he calls the kind of the hinterland of Northern Afghanistan his home. Uh, educated uh, formally, trained formally, fights on behalf of the Mujahideen against the Soviet Union. Uh, proudly Muslim, 
but he is not a, is a, a fundamentalist extremist. He is a member of the Sunni Muslim branch, and most Afghanis are going to be Sunni Muslim. Now, I'll, I'll talk about the distinctions uh, between Sunni and Shia in, in, in our discussion of Iran, because that's where it's going to be most important. But he practices a subset in Sunnism called Sufism. And Sufism is sometimes considered a third branch of Islam. Uh, more appropriately, though, it is, a, it is a subset of Sunnism. There is a Sufi subset in Shiaism, but it gets very complicated for me to explain that. I had TA'd a Islamic history course at UNCG, and to explain that, it would get really dicey. I might try to do that for the next lecture. But for the, for the purposes of this one, I just want to point out that Sufism is a mystical type of practice. Uh, they, uh, they usually drink a little bit of alcohol. Occasionally, they do some drugs. Uh, very occasionally. I don't want to apply this to everybody. And they also are most famous for dancing in circles, which are called whirling dervishes. You may have heard that term before. Sufis belong to lodges similar to, say, like the Knights of Columbus in Catholicism or the Brotherhood of Freemasons. The reason why they drink a little alcohol, even though it's against Islamic custom and tradition, and occasionally, occasionally, I want to really stress that, occasionally do some drugs, is because the dancing in circles and the drinking of alcohol and the, and the, the consumption of some drugs is meant to give them kind of a... Uh, an esoteric, freer mind, hippie experience that brings them closer to God. Now, I don't know if he was into all of this himself, but he was considered quite a devout mystic. He really believed in concentrated prayer, meditation, uh, singing, dancing. He was collegiately educated. He opposed Islamic fundamentalism, which rejects Sufism. He, he rejects the tribalistic extremism that comes from other parts of the countryside, and he wants to see a return to a democratic Afghanistan, uh, either one similar to the Republic of Afghanistan or one similar to the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, the communist one that he fought against, but what, without the obsessive atheism. He wants to see a parliamentary-style republic similar to, say, what you find in France, Germany, or Great Britain. Although instead of having Christianity as its cultural backdrop, it has Islam. The final side, the final side of this three-side civil war is going to be made up of the Islamic fundamentalists, the ones from the hinterland and the countryside. And they're going to be broken into two parts, the Taliban on the left and Al-Qaeda on the right. They are different from each other, but they have similar goals, and they work together uh, symbiotically to achieve these goals to take over Afghanistan and to undertake war against the West and anything considered foreign and uh, atheistic. So let's break down these two groups. The Taliban are also called the students. That's what Taliban means. So they're sometimes referred to as students. They are students of Islamic law and Islamic tradition. Uh, these are very, very radical uh, Afghan men. Some of them are Arab, but most of them are Afghan. And they are supported by wealthy Arabs and Afghans. And specifically, they are made up of the Pashtuns. There are Uz Uzbeks, Turks, and Pakistanis who are involved. Uh, in this group, but they're mainly going to be made up of Pashtun men. And you can tell the difference by looking at their head garments. They, the colors and stripages on these garments uh, delineate tribal line, uh, allegiances as well as ethnic uh, uh, line, I'm, I'm sorry, allegiances. And so because most of these men are going to be Pashtun, they're going to be found predominantly in the south where the Pashtun are in charge. And that makes a lot of sense because... Um, while there are Uzbeks and Turks uh, involved, they're not going to be a very large majority because Uzbeks and Turks are found mainly in the north, uh, closer towards where uh, the northern uh, the northern alliance is under Mossad. So they're going to be those people are going to be linked to him mostly, but there are some Uzbeks and Turks that are involved in the Taliban movement, and it makes a lot of sense that the Pashtuns are in charge and they're in the south, 
and there's Pakistanis involved because the Pakistanis are just slightly south of Afghanistan. And so they're going to be major participants in this, uh, in this Taliban movement. The schools that the Taliban are part of are called madrasas. And these are going to be located in those refugee camps I mentioned before, where many Afghanis were displaced during the Soviet-Afghan war. A lot of these people do come from all over Afghanistan. That's where the Uzbeks and the Turks come from. And they're sort of displaced from the rest of the rest of the country, and in many ways, the rest of the world. And they become radicalized on the Pakistani-Afghan border, living in these refugee camps. And they begin to worship, pray, and eventually are trained in militancy in these madrasas. Now, madrasas are supposed to be religious schools, but these are not purely re religious schools. These are terrorist training camps. The majority of these men, though, are Pashtuns, and Pashtuns in general uh, in Afghani society were much more conservative and much more tribal and traditional. The Pashtun capital, if you want to call it that, was Kandahar. And while Kandahar was a very large city, go back and look at this, look at the lecture, the first lecture where I showed you pictures of, of uh, the Afghani uh, breakdown by ethnicity and uh, by population. While Kandahar is a fairly large city, uh, it's not as cosmopolitan as Kabul and Jalalabad. It's going to be much more working class. It's going to be poorer, and it's going to be very strict in its uh, in its uh, Islamic fundamentalism. It's going to be very conservative in its traditionalism. It's not going to entertain the stewardesses and miniskirts that we saw before. It's going to insist that its women are be covered. And it's going to insist that men, although not by law, will have beards and grow beards. Now, that's not by law. But by the, by the time the Taliban take control, they're going to take these more local customs and tribal customs that are central to Islamic fundamentalism. And they're going to make them the law of the land, strict what we call Sharia law. No alcohol or drugs, men grow beards, women don't work, they cover themselves uh, from head to toe, and they are considered the property of their husbands. All Western culture, as you can see there, pointed out at the very bottom of the slide, is condemned as blasphemous against God. They would say Allah, but Allah and God are one and the same. We have to remember that Islam is part of the Western Abrahamic tradition. So when they refer to God, they are also referring to the God of Abraham. That would be the God of the Jews and the gods of the Christians. But they take uh, all offense to anything that is Western and different that does not fit into this strict interpretation of the Quran, and they declare war on it. I want to make a point about Sharia law. It does get a bad name. It's used a lot in partisan political dialogue today to sort of uh, promote character assass assassination. You'll hear people say, uh, we don't trust the Muslims in Michigan because they live by Sharia law. Or you may see on a news program that uh, a judge in Michigan used Sharia law. Or there's Sharia law now in, in California. That's all nonsense. Uh, all the laws in, in the courts of the United States are secular. Uh, and they are laws that you would recognize in every part of the country. Uh, Sharia law is, is a very broad term. And... Uh, Christianity and Judaism has Sharia law in its own right. It's simply religious law, whether it's Jewish Levitican law or it's the canon law of the Catholic Church and various other Protestant groups and evangelical uh, groups live their lives by a very by, uh, biblical law, uh, whether it's Levitican law or it's uh, Mosaic law, uh, so on and so forth. So all religions have a quote-unquote, all Western religions uh, Judaism, uh, Judaism, Christianity, uh, Islam have quote unquote a Sharia law. That's just a term that means religious law. But in this case, when you see it and when you hear it, it refers to a very specific tribalistic fundamentalist type of law, which is why I don't like to use that term uh, uh, Islamic radicalism because it's such a broad term. And I don't like to use Sharia law without explaining these complicated uh, inroads here because they're Sharia law is simply Sharia law. Uh, a, a Muslim in this country who does not drink is practicing Sharia law. A Muslim in this country that chooses to not work uh, during, Ramadan, during Ramadan is practicing Sharia law. A Catholic or a Christian that fasts during Lent is practicing uh, a specific Christian law. 
so uh, this is a very, very, uh, all, all of these religions have religious law. Sharia law, though, in the way that we're using it here, in the way you might typically hear it all the time, is this much more arcane, dangerous, fanatical form. The kind in which women are covered, beaten, uh, and, and the kind of which terrorism comes out of. I just want to be very clear about that. Part of the third side of this second Afghan civil war uh, is part is mainly is made up of Afghanis who form the Taliban and another group, a subset group called Al Qaeda. Now, whereas the Taliban are predominantly made up of Afghans and most most importantly Pashtuns, Al Qaeda is almost exclusively Arab. These are people from the Middle East. Very few Afghans are involved in Al Qaeda but they have a working relationship. Al-Qaeda is dominated by Osama bin Laden, who was a former freedom fighter for the Mujahideen, a Saudi uh, himself, a very wealthy man who helped to uh, uh, form contacts with uh, contractors and uh, people who could get equipment and aid from Pakistan and India and Iran and other countries into Afghanistan to help the cause. It becomes further and further militant as time goes on. And he is, uh, has strong connections to Egypt and Lebanon and Syria. And he himself, like I said before, is Saudi. So the majority of Al-Qaeda, this, this what becomes a terrorist group, this international terrorist syndicate, is, uh, Arab, is Arab Middle Eastern, not Afghani. But they, are, they have their bases of operation in Afghanistan, and they use the madrasas and these other uh, areas around Afghanistan as training camps for their terrorist cells. And while the Taliban don't like the West and they reject the West and they want to combat the West, they more or less keep to themselves within Afghanistan trying to control Afghanistan. It's Al-Qaeda that turns its eyes out to the international world and sees itself as part of this wider Islamic world. And they're going to undertake jihad, militant jihad, against the West. Anything that's considered outside the purview of of this strict fundamentalist interpretation of Islam. So Christians, Jews, secularists, capitalists, communists, all of those people are considered Western outsiders, infidels, and inv foreign invaders that need to be either pushed away or destroyed. Like their Afghani counterparts in the Taliban, they adhere to strict fundamentalist Islamic law and they operate these schools and camps where people are trained to become soldiers and suicide bombers. The Taliban don't really practice suicide bombing. That's more of an Al-Qaeda type of thing. And these will become the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban as a whole, but Al-Qaeda specifically becomes the, for lack of a better term, the premier terrorist organization in the Islamic world. The second uh, Afghani civil war uh, doesn't go very well for the, uh, the other two sides. The secularists in the urban areas are very quickly defeated, and they either leave or they, they die. Uh, the Northern Alliance, or the Northern Front, under Mohammed, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back. I just want to get his name specifically correct. Uh, Ahmad, I'm sorry, Ahmad, not Mohammed. Ahmad Shah Musad. Or Masood, uh, they do a little bit better. They are able to hold Kabul and Jahalabad for a while, but they are mainly concentrated in the northern section, hence the name the Northern Alliance. And as you can see here, uh, they just simply don't have the numerical or territorial advantage. So you have, by 2001, this is what's left of the Northern Alliance before the American invasion. And slowly but surely, over the course of 1994 to 1996, 92 to 96, the Northern Alliance, was, which initially had a lot of cooperation, a lot of control of these various areas of Afghanistan, quickly lose their ter territory to a much stronger, much more committed, much more radical and zealous uh, uh, Taliban organization. And that's primarily going to be controlling the Pashtun regions here in the south, and creeping further and further north, uh, finding uh, support in these much more isolated tribal communities that seem to have a lot in common, 
with uh, Islamic fundamentalism and fanatical tribalism. So the Northern Alliance is still going to have some territory here, as you can see. This is still held by them, but it's in, it's always contested with the Taliban. And they really, both sides never quite control it, but the Taliban don't really care because this is really can't, this really can't threaten their, their uh, power uh, uh, base here in the cities that they eventually take over and the southern regions near the Pakistani border. But they do have enough power to threaten the Northern Alliance. The Northern Alliance's only power structure and power base is right here in the northeast uh, section of Afghanistan, close to Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, parts of India and China. So things don't go very well for the Northern Alliance. They go much better with the Taliban. Now, the Peshawar Accords in 1992 agree that there's going to be some kind of end of hostilities here between the Mujahideen and all these various factions and, and groups that I, that I described before and, and subgroups within those groups. There's an attempt to end hostilities and create a modern state, a unified state, something akin to the Republic of Afghanistan. And the Northern Alliance is mainly going to spearhead this organization. They're going to want to see a return to a a much more quasi-secular society in which there is secular government, secular law, but Islam has an important place in the society. But unfortunately, these accords will not hold the country together for much long, for, for very long. And while Masood, who's pictured over here uh, in Kabul, is technically the first leader of this kind of post-war Afghanistan intermediary government that's trying to create a modern, long-lasting government, he's slowly going to lose ground to the Taliban and these much more radical forces. Eventually, he's going to have to have, he's, there's going to be a battle for the control of Kabul, which he wins, but at great cost. Eventually, there'll be a siege of Kabul, and he eventually will lose and have to retreat in 1996. So very quickly, over the course of 1994 to 1996, he loses his power base. The Northern Alliance loses its power base in the most populated regions of Afghanistan, the regions right here. And he loses these uh, grounds to the Taliban, who already control cities like Kandahar and Herat, and move further and further north, radicalizing other people along the way who gravitate towards this tribalism. The Taliban take control officially in 1996, and after 1996, the Taliban implement this extreme militant, what we would call fanatical Islamic law. So they are able to garner some support from Saudi Arabia, the Pakistanis, and powerful Afghan Arabs. Uh, the Afghan Arabs is a term used for, for Arab people who make their home in, in Afghanistan, even though they themselves are not of the Afghani ethnicities. They consolidate their power. They promote militarism. They're able to defeat the Northern Alliance and push them further north. They are able to seize major cities like Kandahar and Kabul and Jalalabad. And eventually by 1996, as you can see, they pretty much control the entire country. And while Kabul's population at the beginning of the war was 2 million, it stands in 2001 at just over 500,000. Some of these people were killed. Most of them, though, retreat to the north to be far away from this militant Taliban uh, uh, radical Islamic civilization. And this gives us the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, which exists from 1996 to 2001. Like what you could imagine it would be, it's governed by a, as a strict theocracy under fundamentalist Islamic law. So no drinking, no smoking, men grow beards, women are property, very tribal, very traditional, very patriarchal, all dominated by men with a very specific interpretation of the Quran. Now, Iran, which, which we'll talk about next week, they're technically an, Islam, an Islamic Republic as well, and they have uh, strict interpretations of the Quran themselves. But I want to point out that Iran still has strong elements of Western tradition and openness in their society compared to Afghanistan. Af Afghanistan is going to be even more tribal, even more backwards, even more conservative in their 
in their leanings towards women and towards education. And as you can see here on the right, and do forgive me for the picture, they're going to be very brutal in their attempts to control the country through law and order. Because the Taliban are still going to have the same problems as everybody else had in trying to control Afghanistan. They're going to have to try and unify all of these factions and isolated regions together, and they simply can't do it. But because they appeal to a much more rural class, they have an easier time than saying the modern secularists, the communists, and the socialists. They are also famous for harboring international criminals and terrorists. And this is where Al-Qaeda is going to become involved because Al-Qaeda does not really care what's going on in Afghanistan. They are not in charge of Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda is not going to be hanging people in the streets, as you see here. This is going to be done strictly by the Taliban. Al-Qaeda instead is going to be unleashing jihad across the Western world and any, any part of the modern world, whether it's China, Japan, but mainly Europe and the United States. And so these will be the international terrorists and criminals of which I speak. In 1998, well, actually, let me back up. In 1996 and later in 1998, Osama bin Laden issues two religious proclamations referred to as fatwas. These are in Islamic legalistic interpretations of the Quran, and these are done specifically by Islamic scholars, of which bin Laden is not, although he is educated. And he uses the Quran and uses his interpretation of the Quran to issue a fatwa, a declaration, in which he declares war against the West. He calls for all Muslims around the world to rise up against the enemies of Islam, whether they're communists or capitalists, Americans, Brits, French, what have you. The, enemy, the enemies of, of Islamic fundamentalism, the enemies happen to be secularists. And in 1998, the first strikes of Al-Qaeda are conducted on two embassies that are operated by the United States in Kenya and Tanzania. And you can see the remnants of one of them here, although I don't know which one. So between these two bombings of these two embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, 224 people were killed and over 5,000 people were injured and 12 American civilians were killed. The attack was specifically ordered by bin Laden himself as an act, as a, as an act of vengeance uh, over an event that occurred eight years before. And that was when the United States placed soldiers and troops in Saudi Arabia uh, as a buildup to the, the, uh, what would eventually become the first Persian Gulf War or Desert Storm. Although the American troops were invited in by the Saudi Arabians, and they were, who are Muslim, and they were doing this to liberate Kuwait, which is a Muslim kingdom, uh, Osama bin Laden saw the presence of secular troops, these infidels, in a country which houses Mecca and Medina, the most important cities in Islamic tradition, as being a slap in the face and a grave insult to Islam. And so he attacks American embassies to avenge this. In October of 2000, two years later, an American ship, the USS Cole, was anchored off the coast of, of, of Yemen in port, uh, receiving supplies. A small boat approached from the shore, and when it reached the ship, it exploded, causing this very large hole to be blown up inside of the armored hull of the ship and flooding part of the ship, nearly sinking it. The USS on, uh, attack on the USS Cole was carried out by Al-Qaeda, by suicide bombers, causing 17 American sailors to be killed and 39 others wounded. This would be an indication of something further to come. The, the coal was a major, major uh, wake-up call in the United States. Uh, President Bill Clinton was still in charge of the United States at the time, and he ordered the CIA to examine the possibilities of neutralizing this, this very dangerous uh, terrorist organization that was becoming more and more violent as time went on, going from embassy attacks to attacks on actual military equipment. The United States President Bill Clinton will with the help of the CIA, use intercontinental ballistic missiles 
to attack al-Qaeda positions throughout Afghanistan unofficially. But unfortunately, there are spies uh, and, uh, and uh, intelligence operatives in Afghanistan that are able to get wind of this, and they're able to move their camps elsewhere. So unfortunately, Osama bin Laden survives these missile attacks, and he will live to fight another day, which he will in 2001. Nearly one year after the bombing of the USS Cole and nearly three years after the bombing of, I'm sorry, four years after the bombing of the uh, U.S. embassies in 1998, we have the bombing of the, of the uh, we have the attacks on the World Trade Center in, on September 11, 2001. But this is more broadly referred to as the September 11 terrorist attacks. They were simply not carried out in New York. They were carried out in other places as well. But New York is where the majority of the dead would occur. Over all of the areas affected, Washington, D.C., New York City, and a rural area in Pennsylvania near Shanksville, nearly 3,000 were killed, 2,977. Countless more were wounded. Others had long-term injuries and health effects, and many more are still missing, believed to be presumed dead, but without bodies, there is no way to know for sure. There are rumors that there are people who have amnesia from the attack either psychologically or from a physical injury, and they wander the streets of New York not knowing who they are. This is truly the most devastating attack on U.S. soil in the history of our country, and it's one of the most dangerous and devastating terrorist attacks that ever occurred on a, in a single day. I was 14 when this happened. I was just shy of my 15th birthday. So I do, for, forgive me a slight emotional turn in my voice, uh, I don't talk about 9-11 much. Um, I can, but looking at pictures like this and talking about it really brings back lots of memories because I watched it unfold in my library and I just sat there and watched it for the better part of a school day. So it was, uh, and like so many of you mentioned, it was one of the first events you recalled. So this is still, still something that uh, affects us today. And this is not really historical. It happened 17 years ago, close to 17 years ago now, hard to believe but we can still call this safely a current event. So you can see the facts and figures here. Osama bin Laden issues his fatwas between 1996 and 1998, declaring the West an enemy against God and Allah, and that the Islamic world should rise up against it. We have the bombings in 1998 against the U.S. embassies of Kenya and Tanzania, killing almost uh, 300, almost 250 people are killed, 5,000 are wounded, over 5,000. The 2,000 bombing of the USS Cole, an actual naval ship. The September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon. And the flight in Pennsylvania goes down, but it's believed it was actually meant for the Capitol building. So it was meant to, two planes were meant to hit the World Trade Center buildings, and two planes were meant to hit Washington, D.C., one at the Pentagon and one at the Houses of Congress. I should also point out to you that there are those who are uh, rescue workers, uh, survivors, rescue workers in particular, volunteers who try to find bodies, who try to find people who survive, who, who go to ground zero and who help uh, with the cleanup efforts as well. These people who were, who were not given the appropriate hazmat uh, equipment uh, to survive some of the chemicals and pollutants in the air and of uh, the building itself, uh, the rubble of the building, have suffered long-term health effects in the form of cancer, asthma, uh, various other uh, inflammatory and uh, autoimmune diseases. And when these people do pass away, uh, they are considered uh, uh, victims of the 2011 uh, terrorist attacks. So there are terrorists held at Guantanamo Bay and held at um, uh, in maximum security prisons in Colorado, the ones who did not carry out the actual suicide missions. And uh, these people who still are standing trial or are going to stand trial or have charges brought against them, they have all of these lives put uh, uh, placed against them. They're wanted for the death of 2,977 people. Every time somebody dies from one of these health-related issues, even if it's 20 years after the, after the fact, they are considered a victim of the September 11th attacks. So it's still a, a, a attack with far-reaching repercussions to this very day. If you haven't been to the 9-11 Memorial, I highly encourage you to visit. Uh, it is considered one of the most 
moving and emotional galvanizing monuments ever created. The American response is going to be swift, quick, and decisive. Well, let me rephrase that. Swift, quick, and somewhat decisive. Uh, unfortunately, like so many people who go into Afghanistan, the United States is going to get wrapped up in so much tribal warfare and so many different types of warfare that unfortunately, while we do do a better job than the Soviets, we are still there to this present day fighting against the Afghanis. The major operation that we are focusing on, we're very near the end of the, of the lecture here because I don't want to get too much into uh, the modern day. The, mod, the, the, the primary thing that we're talking about here is Operation Enduring Freedom. What happens is George W. Bush is president during the September 11th attacks, and very quickly after the attacks were held, it, it didn't take a lot of effort to figure out who, who issued them. Uh, bin Laden takes credit, and we have intelligence reports that, told, that really confirmed that he was um, not lying. So on September 24th, 2001, George W. Bush makes a very public de declaration on television. He is speaking directly to the Taliban. He has five foundational points. Deliver all the enemies of America, Al-Qaeda, these Afghan leaders that allowed Al-Qaeda to, to fester and to commit this attack. Release any foreign nationals. Uh, any journalists and foreign nationals are there, leave them alone or release them from, from captivity because the Taliban were, were going around and attacking Red Cross workers and missionaries left and right. To close training camps, to hand over terrorists, and to let the United States go in and inspect these camps. The Taliban initially refuse, but by October 2nd, they realize that Bush is not joking. He is going to attack. The uh, various uh, aircraft carriers like the USS Const Constellation and the USS Abraham Lincoln are being deployed off the coast of uh, uh, Pakistan to fly planes into Afghanistan and to bomb them. The Taliban attempt to negotiate with Bush, but Bush refuses. Now, this is somewhat controversial because there's a belief that maybe we could have gotten these conditions met without having to invade. But by this point, there was a desire by all Americans to bring justice to uh, the American people who were uh, attacked at this time and to get Osama bin Laden. Bush will not negotiate with terrorists. This is a long-standing tradition in American diplomacy. We will not negotiate with terrorists. And Bush continues that. Now, there's a debate about that because are the Taliban truly terrorists? They are terrorists uh, in the broadest sense, but they are technically in charge of Afghanistan. So would negotiating with them be negotiating with terrorists? It's not like negotiating with al-Qaeda. Nevertheless, Bush akins the Taliban to terrorists, and he refuses to negotiate with them. In October 7th, the bombing of Afghanistan begins, and two weeks later, the formal invasion, uh, the ground troops begin to pour over into Afghanistan. And mainly, the, the ground troops that are going to go into Afghanistan will be special forces, the Green Berets, uh, the 101st Airborne, Delta Force, and perhaps in the largest quantity, the Army Rangers, the 76th uh, Airborne Attachment uh, Army Ranger uh, Divisions. And the reason why these groups are picked is because they're very light mobile infantry. And they're, they're, they're uh, well-trained and well-schooled in jumping out of airplanes to get in the, behind enemy lines, in using very, very um, aggressive, fast-moving, special ops-type tactics. They're also familiar, specifically the Army Rangers, with fighting on horseback. And they're going to fight mainly in Afghanistan on horseback before the main army and the Marines are going to come in with their tanks. They also form alliances with the Northern Alliance, their remnants, and they're going to use the North Al Northern Alliance as proxy fighters to go against the Taliban and fight a two-front war. Americans coming in from the south, the Northern Alliance coming in from the north. Operation Enduring Freedom is not the only uh, operation going on. Now, let me rephrase that. It, Afghanistan is not the only part of Operation Enduring Freedom. There's also separate subsequent operations happening, happening simultaneously against the Philippines, against terrorist cells in Africa, North and around the Horn, Central America, the Caribbean Islands, and Central Asia. All of these are initially successful. Unfortunately, Operation Enduring Freedom, specifically in Afghanistan, will go the better part of 13 years. 
We never catch Osama bin Laden, not in Afghanistan. We miss our opportunity. He's able to escape through the Kandahar Pass near Tora Bora. He disappears until eventually he's found in Pakistan and he's killed back in 2015, I believe, uh, under President uh, Barack Obama. But the war has raged on in Afghanistan ever since, under President Bush, President Obama, and now our current president, Donald Trump. The current operation in Afghanistan is Operation Freedom Sentinel. But if you just look at this as a continuation of Operation Enduring Freedom, the United States has been in Afghanistan for nearly 17 years. Uh, nearly 150,000 people in, in total have been killed in Afghanistan, mostly civilians, but also the Taliban as well. About uh, 2,300 to 2,500 American soldiers have been killed, in addition to several thousand American private contractors, or I like to just call them for what they are, mercenaries. Unfortunately, while Americans have been very skilled at creating a new democratic or quote-unquote democratic government in Afghanistan, although its reputation is somewhat corrupt, and women were able to vote in Afghanistan, it is far from a perfect picture. The Taliban were still around and have been still around. There's still tribal divisions around the country. We can't quite hold this coalition together. The Taliban had made a resurgence in 2015, and they've slowly have reconquered a number of areas that initially were lost to the United States and these other coalition forces like the British and the French. Unfortunately, to this present day, the war continues on. And while there's only about 30 to 40,000 American troops in Afghanistan, uh, a far cry from the original uh, 500,000 that were there before, the war still rages on. Americans die every couple of weeks and every couple of days. Civilians die every day. There's mass poverty and starvation. And the Taliban seem to be making a comeback. We really don't know what the future holds. So consider this lecture, consider everything I've told you, and think about a discussion board question. Can Afghanistan be defeated? Can a war in Afghanistan work? Think about it, meditate on it, maybe read some newspaper articles, and feel free to post freely. That concludes our lecture on Afghanistan. Next week, we go to our final week on Iran and the wars in the Persian Gulf. Have a good evening.